Okay, uh, I want to welcome all of us to today's presentation. Uh, and happy Sabbath, uh, wherever you are tuned in, if it is in this country, Kenya. Uh, hoping that uh, our week was well and uh, the Lord is still continuing to guide us. And so this is part three in uh, our ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model uh, uh, series. And uh, today we are looking at uh, betrothal time or uh, the time we are just revisiting it and uh, trying to bring the pieces together before we go to the last part of it, the Nusuin. Uh, and uh, that is um, um, the presentation, the, the last presentation we shall be having uh, will be the, the, the last uh, of the presentations we shall be having is uh, a bride called out and uh, is, uh, we shall be looking at the book of uh, Matthew chapter 25 and how it ties in with the Jewish wedding model. And so uh, I'd like us to pray and then now uh, we can go fully into the revisiting of uh, the erusin or uh, the, the betrothal time that is uh, the engagement time. And so wherever you are, if you can kneel, if you can just bow down for a word of prayer, take the most uh, possible position and uh, let us give thanks to the Lord. Father, again, in this Sabbath, we are so privileged to have a communion with thee and thy son. And Lord, we come not because we are so righteous and we have information that is enough to save us. We come because we are destitute and we need the presence of thy Holy Spirit in our lives to continue in righteousness. And so do not deny us this chance of communing with thee in this Sabbath, Lord, but open our hearts wide that we may get the great truths that you learn or like us to learn. Soften our hearts, Lord, if there are things that uh, we have committed in our lives that uh, are worthy of stripes, in thy great mercy, Lord, visit us, not in thy anger, and rebuke us and chastise us in thy grace. And so, Lord, take our hearts, we can give it not to thee, but Lord, we come that do everything you can do to save us and give us the strength to continue in that salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, we can continue to look uh, into the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model. And uh, today I want to share some things which are close to us and uh, some things that uh, we may resonate with them because uh, uh, it is good to have this information. <clears throat> I say that uh, there is a standard that the Lord will want us to reach. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 48, we are told, be perfect as even your father in heaven is perfect. And so there is nothing less that uh, God will want from us. But in as much as there is nothing less but perfection that the Lord would want from us, uh, I want to show you something so beautiful that uh, uh, I once showed us. I don't know if we remember it, but uh, as I say, and as they say, repetition <clears throat> makes an impression. And this comes from testimonies to the ministers and gospel workers. Um, um, testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. Um, um, let me check out uh, that it can't please the father to give us anything less. I think I'm just missing the, 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 the quotation, but uh, <clears throat> Yeah, it is uh, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 518, paragraph 2. Look at this. This is so beautiful. You will love it. <clears throat> I rejoice in the bright prospects of the future. And so may you. Be cheerful and praise the Lord for his loving kindness. That which you cannot understand, commit to him. 
He loves you and pities your every weakness. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. It will not satisfy the heart of the infinite one to give those who love his son a lesser blessing than he gives his son. Try, try to figure out that for a moment, that um, the God of heaven will never be pleased to give his children, those who are being saved by his grace, something less that he will give his own dear son, Jesus Christ. Meaning that everything that the father has given to his son, Jesus Christ, he is willing to give unto us. And that is why we are made uh, heirs of the eternal inheritance. And so our marriages, God is looking at them as he would want to give his son a perfect bride. One who will live with his son forevermore without sport, without any wrinkle, but that which really is good for eternity. So the Lord will not like to give us who are entering into marriage anything less. The same bride that he will give to his son is the same bride he will give unto us. God will never give his children something less than what he can give his son. And so let us believe that we can have the right relationship. We can have the right courtship. We can have the right engagement and we can have the right marriage. And that is why I say marriage is something so spiritual that we cannot just gloss over it like that. And so the betrothal time, this is some, um, the time that um, now you have paid the dowry and you are going to wait for 12 months before you take the lady. What transpires in these 12 months? That is what I want us to see. What is the husband going through or what is the wife going through, although they have not come together? I touched on this in the previous presentation a little bit, but I want to... Uh, continue where I left, revisiting the erusin, betrothal, and engagement time. <clears throat> so we are told if men are and women are in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate marriage, they should pray four times a day when such a step is anticipated. Admiral's homepage 71. And um, you find that most of the time, the bride, that is Jesus Christ, spend time in the Gethsemane. Uh, 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 garden, just praying that the Lord may be able to embrace his heart and soften the heart of his bridegroom, uh, uh, his bride. As a bridegroom, he sought the will of the father always and knowing how it was delicate to deal with the bride, Actually, he prayed every day the father that uh, the bride's heart may be uh, softened. The bride's heart may come to uh, uh, understand the bridegroom. And so while these two are apart during the betrothal period, that is the 12 months, they should be engaged in prayers. The wife should be engaged in prayers. The husband should be engaged in prayer so that um, when they will finally come together, the new swing or the uh, 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 marriage, that um, all of these differences and how they view things, they will be of one mind. And when they come together, they, were, they are one flesh and not two. And so um, that is something that uh, we are told that uh, uh, Jesus spent time in the prayer in prayer and so the bride and the bridegroom this day after that betroth uh, betrothal time, they should spend time in prayer. And we are told make haste slowly. Few have a correct view of the marriage relation. Many seem to think that it is the attainment of perfect bliss, but if they could know one quote of the heartaches of men and women that are bound by the marriage vow in chains that cannot and dare not break, they will not be surprised that I trace these lines. 
marriage in a majority of cases is a most girl in york there are thousands that are mated but not matched admin is home page 44 and so we are being told make haste slowly now what is this issue of making haste slowly remember when you go through the feast of the sanctuary the seventh feast of the sanctuary you find you find that um the day of Yom Kippur or the day of atonement was only one day where actually investigation was done and then uh, an atonement was made. And on the same day, uh, uh, the, the high priest had a pure congregation um, which was ready to go into the Feast of the Tabernacles, which is the second coming. So the day of atonement was only one day. But you notice one thing that Christ has been performing this uh, 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 um, feast, feast of uh, the Day of Atonement for more than one day. But why is he doing that? He is making haste slowly. Because if he makes it, uh, uh, if uh, he doesn't make haste slowly, then he will come for a church which is not pure or he will find the bride not ready. And so, during the typical uh, day of atonement, it was only one day and then the service was over. But now we are on this day of atonement and it has taken more than one day, meaning that even Christ, who is engaged to the church, is making haste slowly. And so this issue of hurrying up things, today you meet a lady, tomorrow you are uh, 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 doing the issue of uh, uh, planning of the wedding and so on, and uh, within a week everything is accomplished. I, I can say that we have erred in the past in doing these things like this, but we have not copied an example of Jesus Christ, who is the bride, the perfect bridegroom, waiting for a perfect bride, which is His Church. And so we are told, make haste slowly, so that uh, you may not end up regretting what you are doing. You may not end up with a half-baked uh, marriage. Marriage in a majority of cases is a most girl in you. There are thousands that are mated but not matched. The books of heaven are burdened with the woes, the wickedness, and the abuse that lie hidden under the marriage mantle. This is why I warn the young who are of marriageable age to make haste slowly in the choice of companion. And so, uh, during this betrothal, uh, betrothal time, it is a time to learn many things that uh, you would want to correct before you come into the marriage and just find that it is a girl in your And so make, make haste um, uh, slowly if you are in a relationship. Don't hurry up things. Better, better not to, better not to than to do it wrongly. Better not to than to do it wrongly. It will be far better not to marry at all than to be unfortunately married. But seek counsel of God in all things. Be so calm, so submissive to the will of God that you will not be in a fever of excitement and unqualified for his service by your attachment. This is uh, Letters to Young Lovers, page 37, paragraph 2. And then early marriages need to be encouraged. A relation so important as marriage and so far reaching in its results should not be ended upon hastily without sufficient preparation and before the mental and physical powers are well developed. Adventist Home, page 79, paragraph one. Also, too haste spills the yam. Boys and girls enter upon the marriage relation with unripe life immature judgment without noble elevated feelings and take upon themselves the marriage vows wholly led by their boyish and girlish passion. Think about this, the services in the sanctuary, the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. Christ could have decided, okay, I have come to the earth. I have died in the courtyard. I'm taking my church, those who have accepted me back to heaven with me and case closed. Or then he goes to the holy place and says, okay, uh, I think I'll finish the service in the holy place. I, I, I can't wait until the most holy place. And then he takes those who are ready. No, Christ had to move slowly. He had to make haste slowly. And so you find that in the courtyard, there are behaviors which are accepted 
And as you are making friendship, there are behaviors which are accepted because you have not entered into something so uh, tying you together. As you go, if, as you transit from the courtyard, which is the matchmaking and friendship in and relationship into courtship and engagement in the holy place, uh, uh, that is courtship in the holy place, where actually um, we have there a, a perfection that is needed in the holy place uh, and things that can be allowed in courtship. And then as you transit to the most holy place, which is like an engagement, because there is where we find the ark of the covenant, the ark of the testimony, which means that you are entering into a covenant with the, the Lord. Uh, as you enter into the most holy place, there is perfection that is needed there. You don't behave as you are in the courtyard. You don't behave as you are in the most in the holy place. But now you have reached at a point actually you have to be fully mature before you are taken to heaven. And so as you transit from friendship, courtship to engagement, there is a level of maturity that is needed before the, uh, the tie that binds that cannot be broken, which is marriage. And so that is why we are being told that make haste slowly, make haste slowly. There is no need of hurrying up the things and then start regretting about uh, your marriage. And so better to break unwise engagement. Even if an engagement has been ended into without a full understanding of the character of one with whom you intend to unite, do not think that the engagement makes it a positive necessity for you to take upon yourself the marriage vow and link yourself for life to one whom you cannot love and respect. Be very careful how you enter into conditional engagements, but better, far better break the engagement before marriage than separate afterward as many do. And how does this relate with the, because we are looking at family life as um, the, the symbol of uh, the plan of redemption. Christ is not going to take to heaven those who have not fully accepted him. You cannot take to marriage the one whom you can spend eternity with him. Even if the both parties entered into some engagement or some covenant, not knowing the full character of the other, it does not bind you to enter into marriage vow. And so Christ, although many have come and gone to baptismal and baptized, it is not a must that Christ must take them in heaven if they have refused to fully acknowledge him as their savior and accept his power to be the sons of God. No, Christ is only coming for those who are mature and we are not to enter into marriage with people who are, we are not sure that actually we are going to spend a lifetime with them. You may say, but I have given my promise and shall I now retreat it? I answer, if you have made a promise contrary to the scriptures, by all means, retract it without delay and in humility before God, repent of the infatuation that led you to make so rash a pledge. Far better take back such a promise in the fear of God than keep it and thereby dishonor your maker. Far better take back such a promise in fear of God than keep it and thereby dishonor your maker. Admit this home page 48, paragraph 3. Now, uh, again, we are told let every step toward a marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and an honest purpose to please and honor God. Marriage affects the afterlife both in this world and in the world to come. Think about that, that our marriages are not just something that God is looking upon on this earth, but he is looking upon them in the afterlife. And so a sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot approve. And Jesus Christ wouldn't make decisions that his father won't approve of. And so what our father approves of in heaven is much important, more important than even what our earthly father. And so if we are called to obey our parents in the Lord on this earth, how much more our heavenly father who has procured for us salvation through the giving of his son. Again, in this period of uh, the betrothal period, we find that there's a thorough preparation that should be made uh, before 
actually marriage is entered into. And uh, just going through the book of Esther chapter two, verses one to 18, this is um, Esther chapter two, verses one to 18. Esther chapter two, verses one to 18. Maybe this is something that people have never thought about in the Jewish wedding model. And uh, I'll try to read it in your presence. I pray that uh, we may take to heart the things that we are learning. If we haven't entered into marriage, let us please not uh, say, oh, this is too much. You know, sometimes, we think some things are too much until we fall into trap and we start saying, I wish I knew. I wouldn't like in my life to have such a comment, I wish I knew. I wouldn't like you to have such a, a regret in your life. You can be able to evade that statement, I wish I knew. So thorough preparation before marriage. Look at this in the book of Esther before she was given to the king. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, let there be fair, young virgin sought for the king. I hope you are seeing this that uh, a young virgin be sought of. Continued on. And uh, let the king appoint officers in all provinces of his kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace to the house of the women and to the custody of Hague, the king's chamberlain, chamberlain keeper of women and let their things for purification be given unto them. Now it is interested that these women who were to appear before the king and one be selected from them, they were given the items of purification. And you know what the Lord is doing unto us is purifying us as his um, bride so that when we are presented before the father we are spotless in fact i'll just uh, come back to this let me go to the book of first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 and we are told behold what man of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And uh, I think uh, it should be in, in the book of uh, Colossians. How shall we appear like him? Uh, how shall we appear like him? Look at uh, Colossians chapter three, verses one to, to four. If you be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So going back to the book of Esther, we find that purification is done so that when the lady appears before the king, she may be fit to be selected as the wife. And so uh, also Christ is cleansing us so that when we, he appears, we may appear in glory like him and be accepted before the Father. And that is how important the betrothal, betrothal time was, a time of purification. And this is what Esther was going through. And so during your 12 months or the period you have given to each other after the, after the paying of the dowry, there is searching yourself redefining yourself for the marriage so that when you come together, this is a glorious marriage. And this is not just a per happiness, 
but uh, something that has been prepared for. Many people enter into the marriage when they are not prepared and they start preparing when they are in the marriage and just things are in havoc, things are not working out and you find that uh, you start blaming each other and instead of marriage being a happy union, it becomes a, 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 a very sad union or disunion while you are together. So things of purification were given to Esther. And let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jaya, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, so the custody to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. Verse 9, and the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification, with such a things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet. Uh, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place for the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now, when every maid turned was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that, she had been 12 months. You see that period of waiting? 12 months to wait for somebody to be a woman. According to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to weep six months with oil of mire and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, um, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, on the, on the morrow she returned in the second house of the women to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubine. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now, when the town of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keep of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto the king Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tabeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made what? A great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the kings. This is a miniature of a woman betrothed to be married to a king, and then she goes through this purification and she pleases everyone. And so as we go through our courtship, let us understand the spiritual implication of the plan of redemption that even Christ who is our bridegroom and we are the bride is purifying us so that when he appears, we may be like him and dwell with his father. And so in this time, as you are engaged to a man to get married, be sure that you learn all you can learn about this man. You can learn all you can learn about your responsibilities and what is needed of you as a wife when you get united to this person so that you may live ever happily with this man as Christ will ever live happily with the, the bride, which is um, the church. Also, 
this was a thorough preparation and uh, it is it's also reflected in the book of uh, proverbs chapter 31 the book of proverbs chapter 31 we see another thorough preparation from verse 10 to verse 31 we are told who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So as you are preparing I, uh, to get into the marriage, are you studying how actually the heart of the husband will trust in you or the heart of the wife will trust in you and you will do no harm to your partner? She seeketh wool plants and worketh willingly with her hands. When did she learn all these things? She is like the merchant's ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and by it with the fruit of her hands, she planted a vineyard. She guarded her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself covering of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gate. So these are her own works. Her, when did she learn all about this? She learned this when, during the time of betrothal, she found out what the husband would like her to do. She found out where is she, she is going. She did a feasibility study to know where she is going, what is sellable and what is not sellable, what can be found there and what cannot be found there. So that she gets trained in these things, knowing that as she goes there, she will not rely on getting things from afar off but she will be able to deal with the things that are there, but maximize the happiness of the family. And so during the betrothal uh, time, it is a time of learning many things that are needful for a wife or a husband, and to be able to prepare for these things so that when you get to the marriage, these are the things that you can be easily doing without um, uh, being a burden to your husband or to your wife. And so this is a most important time, a time of thorough preparation. And so we are told housework is serving God. During this time, uh, I, I told you that um, she learns a, a lot of things. And some of the things she has to learn is this. Those who do the cooking and the other work of the home are as verily engaged in the service of God as uh, those engaged in the Bible work and they are in a greater need of sympathy and compassion, for there is in a spiritual lines of work that which keeps the spirit cheered, uplifted, and comforted. And remember, we are all servants. The one who does your housework is no less highly regarded by the Lord than the one whose work is to give Bible reading. And so this issue of cooking is something that they have to learn before they come to the marriage, because you don't want to be the first thing for you to be quarreling with your husband or your wife is about the food that uh, is taken to the table. The king upon the throne has no higher work than has the mother. The mother is a queen of her household. She has in her power the molding of her children's characters. 
that they may be fitted for the higher immortal life. An angel could not ask for a higher mission. For in doing this work, she is doing service for God. Let her only realize the high character of her task and it will inspire her with courage. Let her realize the worth of her work and put on the whole arm of God that she may resist the temptation to conform to the world standard. Her work is for time and eternity. And so if being a mother is a work for this time and a work for eternity, how much more should it be studied before you enter into the marriage? In the book of um, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'll read you something very intriguing. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses, um, I'll start from verse 8, but what I'm looking at is verse 15. So have in your mind verse 15, but I'm starting from verse 8. We are told, I hope uh, my screen, okay, I can see it. I will therefore that men pray before, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest, uh, modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but, but which becometh women professing goldness with good works. Let the man, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. What I needed is this verse was 15. Notwithstanding, that is the woman, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So a woman before marriage, she has to learn about childbearing. And this is in connection with faith, with charity, with holiness and sobriety. These are not things to be learned in marriage. Although marriage brings out the experience, but a knowledge of how or what should be done should be learned before the prospect of even uh, thinking about marriage. This should be learned before marriage vows are taken so that um, you may not found yourself in a place where you can raise your family when actually you are being expected to raise your family. And we are being told just through childbearing, women shall be, uh, should, shall be saved. And so that is why we are told that um, her work is for a time and for eternity, the work of a woman. How much important that she should learn all she can learn during the betrothal, betrothal time. It is a sin to place poorly prepared food on the table because the matter of eating concerns the well-being of the entire system. And uh, let not the work of cooking be looked upon as a sort of slavery. What will become of those in our world if all who are engaged in cooking should give up their work with the flimsy excuse that it is not sufficiently dignified? Cooking may be regarded as less desirable than some other lines of work, but in reality, it's a science in value above all other sciences. Cancels on that and uh, uh, foods, page uh, uh, 251. Thus, regards, thus, God regards the preparation of healthful food. This talent should be regarded as equal in value to 10 talents. For it is right use has much to do with keeping the human organism in health because so inseparably connected with life and health, it is the most valuable of all gifts. Now, why is she insisting that this should be learned by all women before they get into marriage? Because um, I want to show you this. It, is, uh, it should be from 5T. Allow me to show you this. Um, it should be in 5T. Okay, that is 90, sorry, 90 page, 159.3. Why is this cooking something so important? Look at this. In fact, I'll start all above so that you may get some few things that you should get, but our point is down there. 
We are not to make the use of flesh food a test of fellowship, but we should consider the influence that professed believers who use flesh foods have over others. As God's messengers, shall we not say to the people, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Shall we not bear a decided testimony against the indulgence of perverted appetite? Will any who are ministers of the gospel proclaiming the most solemn truth ever given to mortals set an example in returning to the flesh pots of Egypt? Will those who are supported by the time from God's storehouse permit themselves by self indulgence to poison the life-giving current flowing through their veins. And this is a serious thing that pastors who are being given tithes for their salary should not be eating meat. It is a serious thing, but I'm not here to talk about pastors and uh, uh, what they should be doing. But it is a serious thing for a pastor who is earning tithe to eat flesh. It is a very serious thing. The way God looks at it, I can go to verses, to verse and verse, quote by quote, pointing out this thing that they shouldn't be feeding on meat. Will they disregard the light and warnings that God has given them? The health of the body is to be regarded as essential for growth in grace and the acquirement of an even temper. I want you to take this in. The right food for your husband will make him have the right temper. The reason why there are many wrangles in the family, it is because husbands and Wives are being fed very bad things and even the children. And so you find that the temperaments of these people are either hyper or they are just uh, very low. And so this causes um, a struggle in the family and dealing with these minds is you can't reason with a husband or a wife because of just what they are eating. How much more important should cooking be learned so that right food may be placed before the table so that people may have a right thinking. If the stomach is not properly cared for, the formation of an upright moral character will be hindered. The brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. Erroneous eating and drinking result in erroneous thinking and acting. And um, we shall be seeing even how this eating and drinking affects your sexuality in your marriage because it um uh, uh it um it um does what it raises the animalistic propensities in men and women and the last thing you will want in marriage is an animal woman or an animal man in your marriage uh, we, we shall come to that that is a, a very serious thing and so it during this betrothal period the 12 months a woman should learn all she can learn to do with the homemaking, cooking food, setting things at the right place, and uh, making the home beautiful and appealing, and such a things like those. Back to our PowerPoint. And so I'll pass over the food. We are told there are very many girls who have married and have families who have but little practical knowledge of the duties devolving upon a wife and mother. Why? Because they didn't use the engagement period well to do research, what is good for this man, what is good for this family, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. People are not using the engagement time or the betrothal time the best way they can. They can read and play upon an instrument of music, but they cannot cook, they cannot make good bread which is very essential to the health of um, the family. Another issue, you saw the woman in Proverbs chapter 31, that her husband was clothed, the children were clothed, and everyone was okay. They were not afraid of the cold, and the house was warm. In uh, Testimonies of the Church, volume 3, page 156, they cannot cut and make garments, these ladies, for they never learned how. They consider these things unessential, and in their married life, they are as dependent upon someone to do these things for them as are their own little children. It is this inexcusable ignorance in regard to the most needful duties of, of life which makes very many unhappy families. So if you neglect these things during the betrothal period, I can tell you, ladies, that you shall have a very unhappy family. It has been proved, and that is what it shall be. Now, what is this thing with garment? I go to the book of Isaiah chapter 61, verses 10. 
Isaiah chapter 61, verses 10. I want us to see how marriage is so linked up with the plan of redemption that you cannot disconnect these two things. And so if you enter into marriage as just a common institution, you miss the whole spiritual aspect of it. Isaiah 61, verses 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So your dressing is an index of the heart. And we are told that there is a particular way that Christ adorns the bride. And so the woman also should learn how she shall be able to dress her family. These are things to be learned prior to the people coming together because Christ is doing these things before the lady or the church is married to him or the, he comes the second time and take the church. And so these things should be learned in engagement before the people come together so that they may not reach there and people are doing just things which are confusing. In fact, in the book of education, I'll refer you to the book of education the book of education. And uh, this is not an abuse, but the prophet tells us um, this. In the book of education, page, um, page uh, 246, paragraph one, no education can be complete that does not teach right principles in regard to dress. Now, you tell me you have a PhD you have a degree, you have whichever the highest credential in this art from the highest university, call it Yale, Oxford, name any university you think of. If in obtaining your PhD, your degree, you never learned about education on grace, then we are being told that education is not complete. Think about that for a moment that you have a degree that is in, in heaven, it is incomplete. In, in this land, it is being seen that it is complete, but in heaven, it is incomplete. Somebody who reached standard two, three, and learned about dress has, is recognized in heaven as has completed his education than you who had a PhD. I leave it at that point, you think about it. And so we should know how to dress our families if we do not know it is from this dressing that many diseases are developed. People leave themselves naked, some parts, and then the blood is chilled in those places, and then people get a lot of diseases. Women dress the way they want. They reach a point of getting pregnancy. They are not getting pregnant. They reach at a time of giving birth. They cannot give birth. They have to go to cesarean just because of dress. How much more important should this be learned before marriage so that when you get into marriage, at least you may do away with these unnecessary expenses of taking your family to the hospital every now and then because of the way they are dressing or having a difficulty in giving birth because of the way you are dressing. And then the family incurs a lot of expenses because you did not use your betrothal time properly. And so this is something that the woman in Proverbs chapter 31 had to learn before she got married and then practiced what she had learned when she got into marriage. Domestic duties. These students need to become familiar with the duties of daily life. They should be taught to do their domestic duties thoroughly and well with as little noise and confusion as possible. Everything should be done decently and in order. The kitchen, all the parts of the building should be kept sweet and clean. Books should be laid aside till the proper season and no more study should be taken than can be attended to without neglecting the household duties. The study of books is not the, to engross the mind to the neglect of home duties upon which the comfort of the family depends. Another issue, you may never be called to do a work which will bring you before the public, but all the work we do that is necessary to be done, be it washing dishes, setting tables, waiting upon the sick, cooking or washing is of moral importance. And until you can cheerfully and happily take up these duties, 
you are not fitted for greater and higher duties. Uh, this is lift him up, page 268, paragraph two. The humble tasks before us are to be taken up by someone and those who do them should feel that they are doing unnecessary and honorable work and that in their mission, humble though it may be, they are doing the work of God just as surely as was Gabriel when sent to the prophet. So as even God sends Gabriel to the prophets, the work of a man and a woman in the home is considered as of the same importance as God sending Gabriel to a prophet. And so these are things to be learned, these are things to be embraced, and these are things to be done cheerfully and not grudgingly. Are all working in their order in their respective spheres? Woman in her home doing the simple duties of life that must be done can and should exhibit faithfulness, obedience, and love as sincere as angels in their sphere. Conformity to the will of God makes any work honorable that must be done. And uh, I, I, I was uh, presenting this somewhere, and uh, someone shot uh, at me a question. Suppose the lady doesn't have money to do these things when you have been engaged to her, what will you do? That is a proper question. And we have to ask ourselves, the church of God do not have the capability to be fit for heaven by itself. What has Christ done? He has made sure that he is part of the problem to be solved by giving his life and providing the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and the gift of the Holy Spirit to enable the bride to be able to get ready for the marriage. And that is the symbol and I can give. Now, somebody say, oh, I have paid dowry, and I have to sponsor this woman to do a course. I have to make her go to, uh, uh, to, to, to a college to learn to cook, to a college to learn how to, to, to sew, to a college to do this and this. What if she dies or what if she rejects me? Now, I don't have an answer for that. You have to walk by faith, even for us, the church is walking by faith to heaven. Now, it, it may seem a laughable or a joking thing, but that is how serious it is. If you have really paid dowry for this woman and God has united the two of you, you should be able to do everything that can help this woman to come and settle with you in a better way. So for what will you benefit when she comes and instead of uh, uh, doing the things, now it is when she have to go to the college to learn to do these things. It, it will be time wasting. So by faith, you better invest in her. When you pay the dowry and you start the engagement, rather than uh, uh, waiting, oh, I, I'm not sure if we will get together. I, I think when you get into engagement, the time you pay the dowry, I think you have just crossed the line of doubting if you are marrying this person. Because you are already in heaven, you are already announced as husband and wife when you pay the dowry and you start the betrothal period. Just as Joseph and Mary were called husband and wife, although they had not come together, but they were still in that period. So heaven counts you as husband and wife in that period. And so I, I don't see why you should withhold your money for this person training up to come and serve the family until she comes. And so think about that for those who have already, who are thinking about uh, entering into marriage or planning to go and pay dowry. And then there's that period before they get into marriage. You can, you can be able to know what is your lady interested to do? What is your husband interested to do? And you can discuss these things and be able to reach an agreement. Okay, when we settle down, this is what we shall be doing. And for to avoid um, during that time to interfere with the family, we can do this during this betrothal period so that when we come together, everything is settled down. People can get uh, 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 crash courses. Six months, three months, you can go to a course, learn how to cook, learn how to seal. The man can learn about agriculture, can learn about carpentry, can learn about mechanic 
in that short period of six months just to be ready at least to have something when you come together and uh, be a family. And so let us not neglect that. Let us not neglect that. The woman, she should be fully competent to guide and instruct her children and to direct her servants, or if need be, to minister with her own hands to the ones of her household. It is her right to understand the mechanism of the human body and the principles of hygiene, the matters of diet, dress, labor, and recreation, and countless others that intimately concern the well-being of her household. Imagine, this is something that the woman should learn. But remember, she is not learning on her own. The husband is supportive of this thing that uh, she is supposed to be learning. Again, we are told, still in Adventist homepage 87, it is her right to obtain such a knowledge of the best methods of treating diseases that she can care for her children in sickness instead of leaving her precious treasures in the hands of stranger, nurses, and physician. For their own sake, they should, while they have opportunity, become intelligent in regard to disease, it is causes, prevention, and cure. This is the husband and the wife. Upon no account should the marriage relation be ended upon until the parties have a knowledge of the duties of a practical domestic life. Adventist homepage 87. So a man or a woman should not be ignorant of his or her requirements in marriage and the responsibilities and be able to prepare beforehand because time is short and what we must do, we must do it quick and thoroughly. Also, here are things which should be considered. Will the one you marry bring happiness to, her, to your home? Is she an economist or will she, if married, not only use all her earnings, uh, but all of you as to gratify vanity, love of appearance? Are her principles correct in this direction? Has she anything now to depend upon? And uh, the prophetess says, I know that uh, to the mind of a man infatuated with love and thoughts of marriage, these questions will be brushed away as though they were of no consequence. But these things should be duly considered for they have a bearing upon your future life. I know that to the mind, uh, she repeats the same, uh, that these things should be duly considered. In your choice of wife, study her character. Will she be one who will be patient and painstaking or will she cease to care for your mother and father um, at the very time when they need a strong son to lean upon, Adventist home page 46. And will she withdraw him from their society to carry out her plans and suit her own pleasure and leave the father and mother who, instead of gaining an affectionate daughter, will have lost a son. A son. And so studying marriage subjection in a wrong way, there is a way that people tend to study marriage subjection in a wrong way. Look at this in 21 MR 216.5. Let those who stand as husbands study the words of Christ, not to find out how complete must be the subjection of the wife, but how he may have the mind of Christ and become purified, refined, and fit to be the Lord of his household. Simply, instead of studying how your wife should be able to serve you. The man who is getting into marriage, you should be studying how you should best serve your wife. And the wife who is just about to get married should not be studying how the husband should care about her, but she should be studying how she should care about the husband. When everyone knows their sphere and their responsibilities, then they will be able to play their part because they have studied and acknowledge that is the truth. And that is, even in um, the plan of redemption, we have to study what pleases Christ rather than what pleases us. And uh, we, uh, and Christ knew what is good for man, how he can serve us better. And we study how we can serve him better. We don't enter into salvation in a selfish manner. What will I gain? We end that there, how will we make the others gain? And so the marriage relationship should be ended in, the study should be that um, how, will the, how will I serve the other one better rather than how will that person serve the other one better? Now, there's a point that I wanted to cover, but I see my time, I have just run out of my time. 
this issue of uh, overburdening the wife. You know, we have dwelt so much on the women, but um, I don't know. Am I still having Brother Fred Ndege in this session? I think I lost him. Sister Angie, how many minutes do you give me more? Probably 10 more. We can we can and we can finish at 10 at 9:40 or yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So we, we have studied about um the, the, the role of the woman so much, but uh, they, uh, there's an aspect of the men that uh, really gets forgotten in these issues about uh, demanding so much from the, the wife rather than the Lord has permitted to be demanded from the wife. In Solomon, Solomon Appeal, the book Solomon Appeal, pages 171 to 176, I'll just read through it. I'll not explain something so that we may finish on time, but uh, you can have the slide so that uh, you may read for yourself. The marriage covenant covers sins of darkest hue. Some men and women professing goldness debase their own bodies through the indulgence of the corrupt passions, which lowers them beneath the brute creation. They abuse the powers God has given them to be preserved in sanctification and honor. Health and life are sacrificed upon the altar of base passion. The higher, nobler powers are brought into subjection to the animal propensities. Those who thus sin are not acquainted with the result of their cause. Could all see the amount of suffering they bring upon themselves by their own wrong and sinful indulgence, they will be alarmed. Some, at least, will shun the cause of sin which brings such a dreaded wages. A miserable existence is entailed upon so large a class that death to them will be preferable to life and many do die prematurely, their lives being sacrificed in the inglorious work of excessive indulgence of animal passions. And we are talking about excessive sex in marriage, which is something that men should be able to control themselves. That an excess in this have led people to die. Because they are married, they think they can commit no sin. People think that because just I'm in marriage, I can use my wife as an idol. I can use her as an object of indulgence and passion. We are told this is sin and it has made women die prematurely by being used in that way. Again, these men and women will one day learn what lust is and behold the result of it is gratification. Passion may be found of as base as quality in the marriage relation as outside of it. We are told that uh, these sinful acts of excessive sex uh, uh, are just found in marriage as it can be found in the outside. You know, people have gone through degrading themselves before they were married. When they enter into marriage, they are not satisfied until they just want to use the, the woman. Anytime they want, they want to use the woman. We are called this is base passion. The apostle Paul exhorts husband to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord to the church. Ephesians 5, 25, 28, and 29. You don't misuse your body as a man. Why should you misuse the body of a, a lady? Because now she has become your wife by demanding excessive of this and this from her. It is not pure love which actuates a man to make his wife an instrument to administer his lust. And men who are married don't see that this is lust. They think that it is a right just to have sex with the woman whenever you need it. No, that is not what God is saying in the scripture. And this is not what is being talked about in inspiration. There must be temperance in all things. We, you know, we only think of temperance when it applies to eating, but there should be temperance in eating, temperance in dressing, temperance in religion, temperance in education, and temperance even in our intercourses. It is the animal passion which claim for indulgence. How few men show their love in the manner specified by the apostle, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might not pollute it, but sanctify and cleanse it, that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the quality of love in the married relation which God recognizes as holy. So excessive in these things, God sees it as not a holy marriage. And excessive in this actually 
makes a person lose some hormones, which makes the mind to be active in religious things. So you find that the moral is the best and it cannot comprehend spiritual things because some excesses have been indulged. And then you have lost some nutrients in your body or uh, minerals in your body, which could enhance your perception and understanding of spiritual things. And so these things sh should be looked upon. Love is pure and a holy principle. Lustful passion will not admit of restraint and will not be dictated or controlled by reason. It is blind to consequences. It will not reason from cause to effect. Many women are suffering from great debility and with settled disease brought upon them because the laws of their being have not been regarded. Nature's laws have been trampled upon. The brain nerve power is squandered by men and women because called into a natural action to gratify base passion. So you find that these excesses in sex in marriage, actually they interfere with brain uh, nerve power. And the highest monster base low passion assumes the delicate name of love. Many professed Christians are more animal than divine. They are in fact about all animal. A man of this type degrades the wife he has promised to nourish and cherish. She is made by him an instrument to minister to the gratification of his low, lustful propensities. Very many women submit to become slaves to lustful passion. They do not possess their bodies in sanctification and honor. Now, the reason we have this 12 months of betrothal is that so that what you have been involved in the past, your body may be purified so that those lusts may die by time, so that when you are getting married, at least your, your body has been trained not to continue the way it has been when you are in the world. So this period of engagement, it helps to reshape your body. If you are being engaged in extramarital affairs, when you get engaged and you have that period of waiting, actually it's a cleansing period from all that you were before you accepted this engagement. And so, uh, again, the wife does not retain the dignity and self-respect she possessed previous to marriage. This holy institution should have preserved and increased her woman respect and holy dignity. Her chest dignified godlike womanhood has been consumed upon the altar of base passion. It has been sacrificed to please her husband. She soon loses respect for her husband, who does not regard the laws to which the brute creation yields obedience. The married life becomes a galling yoke for love dies out and frequently distrust, jealousy, and hate take its place. No man can truly love his wife if she will patiently submit to become his slave and minister to his degraded passions. She loses in her passive, passive submission the value she once possessed in his eyes. He sees her dragged down from everything elevating to a low level. And soon he suspects that she will perhaps as tamely submit to be degraded by another as by himself. He doubts her constant and purity, tires of her and seeks new objects which will arouse and intensify his hellish passion. So when he reaches a point that he is not satisfied with, with this woman, she engage, he engages in masturbation. This is what it's being talked about. He seeks new objects which will arouse and intensify his hellish passions. The law of God is not regarded. These men are worse than brutes. They are demons in human form. They are unacquainted with the elevating and humbling principles of true, of, uh, of true, of sanctified love. That's some a few slides. And so the world is filled with men and women of this order and neat, tasty, expensive houses contain a hell within. Imagine if you can what the offspring of such a Parents must be. Will not the children sing lower in the scale than their parents? Parents give the stamp of character to their children. Children that are born of these parents inherit qualities of mind from them which are of a low and base order. Saturn nourishes anything tending to corruption. The matter now to be settled is, shall the wife feel bound to yield implicitly to the demands of her husband when she sees that nothing but base passion control him? And when her reason and knowledge are convinced that she does it to the injury of her body, which God has enjoined upon her to possess in sanctification and honor and to preserve a living sacrifice to God. Lastly, 
it is not pure holy love which leads the wife to gratify the animal propensities of her husband at the expense of her health and life. If she possesses true love and wisdom, she will seek to divert the mind of her husband from the gratification of lustful passions to high and spiritual themes, dwelling upon interesting spiritual subjects. It may be necessary to humbly and affectionately urge, even at the risk of his displeasure, that she cannot debase her body by yielding to sexual excess. She should, in a tender, kind manner, remind him that God has the first and highest claim upon her entire being, which claim she cannot disregard, for she will be held accountable in the great day of God. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye servants of men. And so we are told that um, the children born in these families will be of low nature, will be of the best nature. You hear people saying that we are born homosexual, we are born lesbians because of the sexual excesses of their parents in the, in the marriage life. These children were born without a normal, uh, uh, um, normal nerves and normal brains because the parents engage in excesses. And so you find that uh, a lady is born, a young girl is born and she's attracted to another young lady. A young man is born and attracted to men because there are things which have been done in marriage which are of low nature and the children have suffered the consequences of what the parents have indulged in. And so when you hear that people are born in such a way, try to think about how is that marriage, how, how are the parents actually uh, behaving in their houses. Now, In uh, Manuscript List, Volume 4, page 381, will the man who loves his wife as Christ loved the church imperil her life and cut off from all missionary service by filling her hands and mind with grave responsibilities which children bring with them into the world? Will he gratify his own passion to the sacrifice of his wife, subjecting her as often as possible to the painful ordeal of maternity? Is this cherishing the wife as Christ nourishes and cherishes the church? In pursuing such a course, is the husband studying the spiritual and physical good of his wife that he may present her to God without spot and blameless. Now, I want to read this last slide. This is the last slide. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. And this is what we should be doing in our engagement. We should give ourselves time to mature and to learn what is possible to make a good marriage, then come together for marriage as even Christ is waiting with patience. I pray that the Lord bless us. I pray that uh, wherever we have erred, that um, God may give us the strength to do the right thing. And I know we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. And I believe he who has started a good work in us will accomplish it even unto the day of the second coming of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.6. May the Lord bless us and shall we pray as we bring this to a close. Dear Father in heaven, information is not good if it is not used in the right way. After having this information, what we pray is the spirit of wisdom on how to apply it in our lives that we may not read for other people, but we may read for ourselves, and how we shall be able to be good husbands and good wives and how to serve each other better. Bless your children, and in this Sabbath, continue communing with us. In Christ Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. 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 God bless us all, and uh, I really apologize for taking more than one hour, but uh, I believe that it was worth it, and uh, may the Lord be with us.